Hi everybody, welcome to our online sermon. This week we are meeting corporately for the first time at North Rock Church, 10100 Grant Street, if you're interested. Uh, next time in joining us, we meet the second and fourth Saturdays of the month at 6 p.m. But we have our online recording of the sermon for anyone who missed it or wants to go back and listen to the message or maybe he's listening from somewhere else in the world. You never know. So we're so glad you've joined us in this format and just want to welcome you as we dive into God's word. This last week, my sister Abby sent an article to me. It was by Jake Meter, writing for The Atlantic, and it was called The Misunderstood Reason Millions of Americans Stopped Going to Church. In the article, Meter explains that 40 million Americans have stopped going to church in the last 25 years. That is the largest change in church attendance in American history. And the number one reason we often hear of or think of is church hurt. That's a very simple term for a very complex reality, a mixture of uh, seeing the reality of religious abuse and moral corruption that has left a lot of people reeling. It's a complex reality that uh, many people at Hill City, including myself, can relate to. In fact, over the last four years that I've been with you guys at Hill City, I've noticed sort of this theme that our church community has really been a place that welcomes and sort of attracts people who have suffered some sort of church hurt or are still recovering from a deep woundedness that often was related to the church. That's a really wonderful and heavy thing that we consider as we shepherd this community. But part of the reason God has chosen, it seems to use Hill City in this way, is because the leadership by and large, has all experienced church hurt. Toxic church leadership, abusive situations, scripture uh, manipulated and used to frighten, cults of personality, encouragement to uh, grow as a leader by being more and more emotionally cut off from people, and many, many other things. You may be nodding along right now, maybe not because you experienced church hurt in your own life, but because you've read about it. I mean, who could have missed the headlines that we've had in the last few years as leader after leader has a very public fall from grace? I've shared before the gifts and weaknesses of the church I grew up in. And if you wanted a sort of quick history lesson on its origins, you actually now can watch a movie. It's called Jesus Revolution on Netflix. And if you can imagine the churches that were planted out of that early Jesus movement in California, then you can imagine my church that I grew up in a couple generations removed being planted in Colorado. The very good and the very bad. I remember sitting with someone at the church um, that I so, who had sort of taken me under her wing, and um, she was one of those Jesus hippies in her youth, one of those Jesus people, and she was a person who would talk a lot and tell stories of revivals led by young people about all these passionate high schoolers and college students coming to know the Lord about believers who had been barred from entry in other more traditional denominations because of the company they kept or the music they listened to. And ironically, I also remember a very painful time sitting with her as she told me I spent too much time with unimportant people, that I should instead focus more on making connections with the upper echelons of the staff that I was too emotionally involved. So from my own life, that small snippet, uh, to the life of Hill City as a community, to a broad picture of the church, it is safe to say, yeah, we can totally get why people are fed up with the gaslighting and the manipulation and the emotional unhealth and the moral corruption and have just said goodbye to the church. And let me say definitively, in case it's never been said before, I'm sorry. You should have never had to go through that. And whatever was said or done to you in the name of Jesus was wrong. It was wrong. 
But the article that I was reading actually didn't stop there. It, it brought something more surprising to the surface. So the uh, author, Jake Meter, drew from a study that had been recently done of the de-churched. And it found that while church hurt was the number two reason that people, so many people have left the church, the number one reason was something much more mundane. As he writes, for the majority, it is just how American life works in the 21st century. Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality, care, or common life. Rather, it is designed to maximize individual accomplishment as defined by professional and financial success. Such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's professional life or, as one ages, the professional prospect of one's children. Workism reigns in America, and because of it, community in America, religious community included, is a math problem that doesn't add up. I found that very interesting. The misunderstood reason millions are leaving the church, the number one reason of these thousands of people surveyed, was actually that church just doesn't work in our American lives. I mean, we can see this in our own lives and in others, even if we've stayed in the church, that as we rearrange ske schedules to work 80 plus hours, yeah, some of us just can't make it to church. Or when we have kids in three sports with three different schedules and can't remember the last time we caught up with people we're supposed to be praying for. Add to that the cost of living, uh, the sheer injustice of our healthcare system, that huge financial burden that weighs on people just to make ends meet, and suddenly you have a recipe that seems like it can't include community. So two reasons for leaving. The first, surprisingly, the church simply doesn't work with American life. And second, the church has deeply hurt many of us. So let's keep those in mind as we read our scripture for today, Romans 12, 1 through 13. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in, a, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, if you're not quite seeing how this passage lines up with those two reasons people are leaving church, let me give you some background. In this day and time when Paul was writing, church simply didn't work for a Roman lifestyle. This was the heart of the empire, the seat of Caesar's power, a place where anti-Semitic thought was actually quite popular, a place where your success in business, in marriage, in life 
was determined by conformity to standards of idolatry and sometimes sleeping around. There was likely many there who would have asked Paul from that Roman church, why the church just as we ask today? Why the church? I've got guild fees. I have to make a show of making an offering to Caesar if I want my boss to like me. I have to be patriotic in this way. I have to give my patron or my boss the due honor. I have to show the head of my family that I mean business, that I will secure our legacy, that I will work as many hours as possible to get the job done. Second, the Roman church also had many who were hurt deeply. Many scholars think it's likely that as Emperor Claudius had expelled Jews from Rome for a period of about five years, not too long before this letter was written, that this affected the structure of these house churches, paving the way for deep conflicts, for Gentile believers to actually take over most of the roles that Jewish believers might have previously held, and even woefully for some of that anti-Semitism of the empire to creep in. It may be that after Jewish people were let back into Rome, they found these house churches they had been a part of radically changed. There was no room for them anymore in leadership. And perhaps there were quarrels about status leading to many Jewish believers pointing to their own superiority as the true people of God. This all seems to be something that the letter of Romans is addressing, resulting in church hurt, very real church hurt for the people who were in this community. So in the midst of these twin concerns, the same that we deal with today, Paul pens a letter to a church he's never met. He writes the book of Romans to a church network in Rome, having never been there before, and he entrusts this letter to a female leader named Phoebe, who goes and carries this letter to them, entrusted by Paul to read and perhaps explain any difficult passages that they had questions about. Of course, there's 11 chapters before we get to the part that we read, and you're probably very familiar with some of it, but let me just overview. In Romans 1 through 11, we see this amazing exploration of God's cosmic redemption plan. The the story of humanity's brokenness, God's plan, and Jesus's saving power. Do you remember your Romans road at all? Maybe from Sunday school or from somebody who might have witnessed to you once upon a time. That's included in there. So Romans 1 through 11 ends what we might call the explanation at a macro level of the amazing story of God's mercy. Romans 1 through 11 explains the contents of the gospel, while where we pick up in Romans 12 and 13, it explains how to be the gospel. Paul's answer to why the church, in light of it not working that great, in light of it not working with Roman life, in light of it hurting so many, is found in this section. And we can break it into three parts. Why the church? Because of God's mercy, because we are a body, and because we need the practice because of God's mercy. Romans 12, one through two, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Therefore, Because of everything I've already written in chapters 1 through 11, Paul writes, because of the whole scope of God's cosmic redemption plan and in view of beholding the marvelous mystery of God's mercy that we've spent all this time talking about because of the ransom of Jesus's life for yours because of his love. Take that in for a moment. The answer to being squeezed into the mold of the Roman or American culture and life is not to try harder and become a legalist. It's not to attend every church service, make sure you're doing all the right things, 
attend every class and prayer meeting. The answer is to remember God's mercy. And how easily we forget, leaving us feeling vaguely guilty for not making enough time for church, vaguely guilty for our busyness and our mixed up priorities. But we shouldn't be because instead we're supposed to view it in light of God's mercy. So we just find an easier pattern. We see the world's pattern all around us, one of clear achievement goals. If I just get that promotion, if I just make this much money, if my kids just turn out okay, and church becomes a hobby, that sort of very slender sliver of our pie chart of life. But true worship isn't any of those things. It's remembering each day with every breath that we have that it all comes from God. To take in his love deeply, to believe in it, to cherish it, and to share it with those around you. This may require some radical rearranging because the whole living sacrifice thing isn't mild language. If God's mercy matters more than achievement, maybe you don't need to work those extra hours. If God's mercy matters more than success, then maybe your goals of getting the next bigger and best fill in the blank doesn't matter. If God's mercy matters more than upward progress, maybe your life is going to start looking a lot weirder to a lot more people because of God's mercy. Also, because we are a body, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, because we are a body. Last time we gathered for service, we had baptisms for eight uh, kids and teenagers, and it got me thinking about the body, that each one of those kids and teen teenagers has been uniquely gifted and purposed to live the life they have right now as kids, as teenagers, as part of the church. As John has said, not the future church, but the church right now. But sometimes we get so focused on that me and Jesus sort of thinking, we forget that everything Jesus did was for his bride, for the church to be established, filled with the Holy Spirit and sent out declaring the kingdom of God. Not the big corporate American church as we think about it, the sort of CEO level church dumb, right? Trying to build a kingdom on earth. But the real church, all believers everywhere, expressed individually in local congregations, gatherings of his disciples. Paul says, don't, don't get it twisted. Think of yourself rightly as part of the whole, soberly, carefully. You aren't meant to do this by yourself. You're not meant to do it just with your nuclear family either. You are meant for a body. And the body only works when each member is working. It's really interesting that Paul uses this imagery, not only because this might have been a congregation, like we said, with deep hurt, with real uh, anger towards each other, but because in Roman culture, philosophers use the metaphor of the body to explain their hierarchy. But where they declared this really clear delineation, where they exhorted slaves to stay on the bottom and the supposed weak to obey the strong, Paul turns the illustration on its head. Christ is who we are part of. Christ is the head of the body. We are each members. We're a part of it. Every one of us, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. Everyone has been given gifts for the benefit of each other. We belong to each other. The only way it works is mutual love and care. So be a body. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. 
this section sort of gets into the real good stuff because as my third point said, we need the practice. Why the church? Because we need the practice, this kingdom living practice. And I could probably spend the rest of my life trying to practice love being sincere. I don't know about you, but I think that's something that I need to work on every single day. This list of practical and punchy statements is the remedy to all of the moral failings and the corruption and the fallenness that we've seen in the American church in the last few years. What pastor wouldn't be held accountable if love is to be sincere, if evil is to be hated? What person would go hungry if we shared with those in need? How could any conflict end poorly if we honored one another above ourselves? How could anyone feel unwelcome if we ran after, we pursued hospitality, opening our homes and our lives to each other? Boy, <laughs> we definitely need the practice. So I've shared what the church can look like at its worst, right? Let me share what it looks like at its best. It looks like our house church gathered at the Ramirez's house even after they've had a really long and exhausting week. It looks like us singing worship songs together and laughing at Calvin, dancing in the living room. It looks like cussing and crying and sharing what's actually going on in our lives. It looks like not being easily offended at forgiving wrongs, asking questions and studying the Bible together. It looks like laughing at Isaac's random memes in our text thread. The church at its best looks like community dinners on Thursday nights. It looks like the awkward and sometimes uncomfortable conversation you have with the friends who come in. It looks like people scooping food and kids handing out clothes. And it looks like people eating together and conversing together. Sometimes it looks like the mic going out and shouting the end of the Christ story. Jesus welcomes you to his table. And it looks like four years that I've got to spend in this beautiful and complex community called Hill City. It looks like crying over people who have left and being comforted by those who have stayed. It looks like children growing up and running around and feeling safe at home. It looks like leaders who call each other out and encourage one another. It looks like new people being mobbed by like 10, 10 people introducing themselves and a whole room singing hallelujah and prayers and crying and yes, cleaning up the mess afterwards. It looks like communion, the bread and the blood shared together. Why church? Because it's God's best for us if we only choose to be a part. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just pray that you would speak to every person listening to this message, that you would heal those deep places of hurt that they feel, the, the places of betrayal or loss or the places where they have witnessed hypocrisy in a way that really made them jaded against the church. Lord, we pray you would come and heal those places of woundedness. We also ask, Lord, that you would empower and strengthen those in your church community, that you continue to lead disciples in mutuality, in common caring for one another, in the practice of hospitality and sincere love. Just ask, Lord, that you would create in Hill City, a community of believers that supports one another, that practices their giftedness, that continues to pursue the lost. And we just thank you for all that you've done. In view of your mercy, Lord, we continue on knowing that you are faithful. Just thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.